In this episode, you're going to learn how the small choices you make as a service designer on an individual level have the power to transform entire systems. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Lauren Sirota, and this is The Service Design Show, episode 109. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about empowering you with the most effective skills and strategies so you can design services that win the hearts of people and business. And someone who's been doing that for a very long time is Lauren Sorota. Lauren is the head of service design at the Yoma Bank in Myanmar. I'm really excited to have Lauren on the show because she's got a lot of experience with putting design to work in really unconventional areas. And we're going to talk about what we can learn as a community from non-designers and how asking better questions leads to more impact. So through this episode, you're going to discover how to design solutions that are embraced by the people who are going to use them and by the organization that needs to provide them. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation with Lauren Sorota. Welcome to the show, Lauren. Hey, Mark. Hey. Um, actually, we used to be in uh, very remote locations or far apart, and now we're much closer, right? You're almost next door to me. I am much closer, yes. It's been a crazy year. <laughs> Yeah, so for the people who don't know who you are, uh, could you give like a brief introduction and maybe share a little bit about where you've been and where you are today? <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, my name is Lauren Sirota. I'm a designer and um, kind of consumer insights research consultant. I am currently in Amsterdam, but um, my home base is still technically Myanmar. Uh, I was most recently the head of service design at a company called Yoma Bank, which is a domestic commercial bank in Myanmar. And um, I'm here because of COVID and travel restrictions, but yeah. not a bad place to be stuck. Um, and I made the transition back into consulting in about March. So it's worked out relatively well to be based here. That, that must have been a transition from Myanmar to, to Amsterdam. Yeah, uh, maybe we'll get into that uh, later. Lauren, uh, a new element that we've introduced to the show a few episodes ago is a 60 second rapid fire. And I don't prepare any of my guests, so I didn't do it with you either. <laughs> so the goal is to answer these questions as quickly as possible. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, let's do it. What's always in your fridge? In the summer, blueberries. In the winter, whatever's in season in the winter. Probably like kale or turnips or carrots or something. Okay. Which book are you reading at the moment, if any? Mm, I'm glad you asked because I'm very excited about it. Um, it's a, a collection of short, short story sci-fi um, from a bunch of different Chinese authors. So it's kind of like an introduction to... Um, a bunch of different really well-known authors who write both in, in Mandarin and kind of translate it to English themselves. And then the person who put the compilation together translated it, um, the things that weren't translated. And um, it's, it's very cool. I highly cool. recommend it. We'll link to it in the show notes. Which superpower would you like to have? Um, I would like to be able to um, disarm people. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So to get people to, to see people's true intent and be able to work with that. What did you want to be when you were a kid? A designer. Oh, well, <laughs> good for <laughs> you. And the final question is, what was the first time you sort of learned about service design? Um, I, probably early in my career. I don't think that I... I the way that I learned design was a combination of industrial design and interaction design. And a lot of the work that I was doing at the time was service design, but I wasn't familiar with the term. Sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I probably started learning about the term and the kind of community of practice around it in like 2007, 2008, um, but still didn't necessarily know that I was practicing it, even though I was. 
I, I think that's the most common uh, journey a lot of service designers have have gone through. Uh, yeah, so uh, again, quite a lo long time. Uh, the topic for uh, this chat is going to be quite interesting uh, because we did a little bit of preparation and the conclusion uh, sort of was that we're going to explore the the power we have not only as designers but as people and the choice through the choices we make in our designs and both as consumers so let's let's explore that right and, and let me start with a question so lauren when you were thinking about this topic what was the thing that that you sort of see into the future what's what's the thing about making choices as consumers, people, and designers that um, you think we should be thinking about right now? I, I think that there's two key things. And one of them is um, that I think some of the challenges that the world's facing right now are so big <clears throat> that they can't really be solved by any one methodology alone. And actually, they need to be solved by everybody making a little bit of a change, or at least being a lot more conscious about the decisions that they make. Um, and I see that as a big fight because there are a lot of forces that push people um, into kind of blind consumption and um, behaviors where they're not very, um, they don't have a lot of agency over their control, even though they might feel like it. So um, that's kind of one, one side of it. So I think that it's really imminent when we think about things like climate change or um, equality and equity um, that everybody recognizes that they play a role. Um, and I think that design is a word, something that we'll talk about a lot, I think is, is a challenging word because it has, it's so loaded and everybody has, like semantically, it's just very difficult. Um, but there are kind of design attributed activities and mindsets that can really help approach some of the things that could happen to resolve some of these issues on a larger scale. So that sounds really interesting and what always uh fascinates me is at which moment did you become aware that this is something that you feel like pursuing that this is a topic that you're interested in and want to explore was there a pivotal moment in your life or is this something that grew gradually there, yeah there were a couple um and, I, and the first one was actually in school when i was learning about interaction design and i realized yeah, I, I thought that I wanted, I knew I wanted to be a designer, but I, it's because I liked making things. Um, and so I thought that I would be a furniture designer or do something kind of in the built environment, which kind of led me to industrial design. And in interaction design, a lot of the work that we were doing was workflow analysis and, and, and things that interaction designers do. And I, I kept thinking, like, some of these the breakdown points are like these teeny tiny things that weren't even a decision. They're a byproduct of a decision. Um, and if we fix them, we could actually fix an entire system in some cases. So I thought that was really powerful um, and very cool. And the more and more I matured in my career, I realized that a lot of times those decisions aren't made by designers. And um, they're made by the compliance people or the risk people or a business person or an engineer or an operations person. And so that just got me more and more interested in um, kind of design concepts playing more of a role in those things and then also acknowledging where people are making decisions that don't involve designers and have their own methodologies and frameworks that maybe designers should be aware of. Hmm. And, and I would say that opens uh, a, a rabbit hole because there are a lot of areas where designers still aren't involved and uh, don't have any influence. Um, if we took if we take a look at the, the, the bigger picture, like what what is at stake now? Like, where are we um, heading to? I, well, well, yeah, for, I think for designers, uh, let me talk about, first of all, for our industry, I think it will, <laughs> I think we're already getting relinquished mm. into this, this bucket of the annoying, expensive post-it note idealist. Um, so I think that there's a risk that it further marginalizes our industry um, and puts us back into a place we were prior, which was um, aesthetics which I think was okay. The superficial um, layers, yeah. Yeah, and, and things that people, you know, we've really fought hard to, we've fought hard to change the definition of design from these things. And there were people in the 50s and 60s that were designing things differently, and it wasn't just about superficiality, but it wasn't part of business discussion, right? It was just something the designers and the engineers did. And so I think that there's a risk to 
to design if we don't start changing and we don't start um, getting over ourselves, mm. honestly. And, and then I think that... Oh. Yeah, so um, we can dive into that because what is the thing that we need to get over? Like, And what is the thing that you feel we need to change in, in design? I, I think that one of the most beautiful things about people who go into design is... Um, one design gives you an ability to create, and that's tremendously powerful, right? Um, and a lot of people who choose to go into design love to create and get um, gratification from making things. Um, so that power, I think, can sometimes yeah, make people think that they're better than others or give them tools that put them at an advantage above others that don't necessarily have those same skills. Mm -hmm. um, also, design education is a pretty privileged space. <laughs> So people who get access to formal design training are um, oftentimes coming from a very specific socioeconomic class, very specific racial background. Um, and so design just by nature, like a lot of fields, is just very skewed. Um, pre-selected, basically. Yeah. It's and so the solutions are as well. Yes. And so I think that it's important for designers to not... Um, take us personally, because if you're a designer that's representative of the majority of designers, that's okay. You're still a, you might be a great designer, but just recognize the responsibility that you have to listen. Um, recognize, one, that being a designer doesn't make you better than anybody else. It doesn't mean your approaches are better than anyone else. Um, and then also realize that there are probably other people who might be a better designer than you, who are in the room even sometimes, but haven't been given the opportunity to learn what it means to think this way or given permission to prototype things. So I think there's, it's just a bit of a mindset shift for the people who are in those positions now. Um, and, and I actually, there, I think there are a lot of people who are calling this out now, um, but there's also a lot of kind of shaming. And I don't think that that's very productive, like to call up people's privilege and tell them that they should feel bad about it. But I think it's actually powerful if people can flip that and turn it into, you know, say, okay, I, I have a seat at this table. Um, I have all of these resources. What happens if I, instead of saying this is what I think, ask a question of somebody who hasn't spoken up? So it's, it's, um, it's at, at least it sounds to me like um, creating awareness about these uh, uh, it's it's not yeah maybe there are flaws in the existing design practice uh, and then once you are aware of them you can actually start changing things and one of the things that we can start changing is um, I, I sometimes call it the god complex if you are able to create then you feel like you can change everything and you you know everything uh, and a bit more humility in the design practice wouldn't uh, wouldn't be a bad thing right. Well, one of the things, I, I like that you call it that because it, there are designers who have a lot of humility, so I don't want to, there are, but you're right, it does, um, there's a, a, a power in, in being able to make things. Um, but one of the things that I always remind my team and remind myself is, like, we need all of the other practices to make our things a reality. So sure. yeah. that, um, it, and it's always bothered me. I think it's changing now, but design education doesn't really teach you a lot about business. It doesn't teach you about operations. Um, it teaches you a little bit about technology, right, depending on what kind of degree you get or, or kind of where you get exposure. Um, but, but these things and being literate to them, I see as being just as important to understanding user needs. Hmm. And so I think that that's... Um, I think it's one thing, like, I think the ego can sometimes be a good thing because it brings conviction, which is necessary for forward momentum, especially when you're working in a space of ambiguity or doing something new, like that's tremendously important, but not if it doesn't put all of those other kind of uh, practices and perspectives um, at equal weight to the design perspective or the user perspective. Hmm. <clears throat> I'm um, the the one of the metaphors that I've been using lately a lot is like uh, design and especially service design is a practice where you try to coordinate or orchestrate and work together with other disciplines to create something that benefits well the people listening to the to the music and I think if we uh, still look at design education design is very much much thought in a way where it's a uh, step in a process rather than something that brings uh, together different uh, perspectives, right? 
Yeah, I agree. And I actually think that that's why service design as a term and as a practice is important because it starts to break those things down. Um, but, but yeah, I think that it's still, and, and this is why the word design I think is so challenging because everyone does have a, a notion sure. of what yeah. it is. Yeah. And, and service design is similarly challenging. I remember for the first six months I was at Yoma, people thought I was literally just working on customer service, like designing scripts sure. and yeah. Yeah. setting up the call center, right? Um, and that was difficult for me because I said, yeah, that could be something I do <laughs> if you need it, right? If it means that we have better outcomes um, in terms of the products we put out there and how we serve our customers. And so things like um, John Mayetta talks about this a lot, the emergence of the, the equally ambiguous but maybe more appropriate term customer experience, right? Mm -hmm. Or things that people at least understand because I found that using those words, and I'm actually really proud of, um, I've recently learned that the team at Yoma Bank that I used to lead um, is now designing customer experience. Um, and the team lead has told me that's already changed the way that the rest of the organization sure. works with them. Yeah. Because previously, there had to be this long discussion about why she needed to be in the room when there's a discussion, you know, when they're talking about changing the terms and conditions. They're like, yeah. there's no interface yeah. here. Yeah. And she said, yeah, but it impacts the customer experience. And so I think that that's, um, these little changes are really significant. I, I um one of the things, uh, again, I, I'm only thinking metaphors in my head and, and analogies. And one of the um, answers that I give to the question, like, what, uh, why the rise of service design? Why is service design growing at this moment? And one of my answers is that companies are starting to see the business value of customer experience. But customer experience isn't a practice. It's, it's not a field. So you need skills and methods and tools to actually work on creating a better customer experience and service design lends itself really well to provide and create a better customer experience. So in that sense, it makes a lot of sense to talk about what it actually does and sometimes leave that how uh, it does it sort of uh, onto the backstage and, and just talk about what is the thing that we're trying uh, to contribute to. And, and so it makes a lot of sense to talk about customer experience. You know what's so tough about that, though, is that um, I think everyone agrees with that, right? And I think it's beautiful because you can't really have anybody say, we don't care about customer experience. Well, you, that's yeah. just it. <laughs> unless they, they really don't, unless you have a business that's purely about efficiency or really. Um, yeah. The challenge is where does that where does that practice sit in the organization and how do they engage right and what is the demand management framework for that practice yeah. so yeah. it's kind of um, it's tricky to think about design ops when you have a customer experience practice that is all encompassing. I think but that's it is. a tension yeah, that but a lot it of is. people face. And, and, yeah, and, and, but it, that doesn't change when you either talk about customer experience or service design. That all encompassing, the holistic perspective, is definitely something that's super hard to or operationalize. I'm really curious about your, uh, uh, I don't like the word, war stories, or but you, the, the battle scars. Um, how have you uh, seen this play out in your own practice? Do you have some examples where the helping people to make better choices, helping, uh, helping yourself to make better choices as, uh, as a designer? Can you share some, some examples with us? Yeah, yeah, there's a few. And, and I'll um, caveat this by saying there's a lot of other good examples, of course, from my consulting experience that I wish I could share and I can't. But the ones that I'll share with you, I think are interesting, and they aren't just mine. So most of them, I would say, I had like a nominal role in. Um, but they were still kind of, un there was a team that I led through executing them, for example. So the first one is with Yoma Bank, we had a product that we launched within the first six months of me being there, that was a um, a microcredit product. And in Myanmar, the banking sector is very nascent. So um, at that time, fewer than 10% of people were actively using bank accounts, um, fewer than 10% of the people in the country. And there's a big distribution problem because about 70% of the population is rural. So they're difficult. it's difficult for them to get to a bank branch. Um, they're hard to reach. So obviously a huge opportunity for digital services. And um, And what we wanted to do was convince the bank, who was already kind of philosophically on board, but didn't necessarily believe it yet. We wanted to convince them that there was actually a market to compete with MFIs, microfinance institutions, um, and that if we gave people um, a little bit more dignity around having to borrow a small amount of money for whatever it might be, um, that that was a very um, significant value proposition in the market. 
So this was a tough thing for people to wrap their heads around. And for, um, which, which people uh, needed to wrap their head around? I, I think, um, so traditionally, banking in Myanmar had been for the wealthy and for corporations. And they thought, you know, how are we going to make money as a bank off of you know, $80 US microloans, right? Um, sure. And how are people going to access this? These people don't have smartphones. So there were a lot of these um, paradigms, kind of, yeah, yeah, that, that needed to be tweaked. And there was fortunately an openness, which is kind of why I was there in the first place to explore these things. Um, but how we did it, I think, was really important. And I attribute a lot of this to the former leader of the team that I was working under, um, this guy Mark Flaming, who um, set it up in such a way that we really piloted with the tools that we had. So we kind of built our own mini version of it using, you know, the same thing that most designers will do when they're doing a kind of smoke and mirrors test and gave it three months to run to prove that there was a demand. Um, and there were a lot of constraints and we were able to both identify those. So we, we set up a, a proper pilot. We said, okay, these are the kind of variables that we have to take into account. These are the things that might affect the outcomes. Um, and we used that to prove that there was actually a demand in the market, tweak the product, and then move it into a stage where we developed it into a proper product. Um, and I think most designers go through this process in some shape or form, but how we did it was important. Tell so us. Yeah. From, from the first day, um, so first of all, something important is that, to understand is that my team was the design and product team. So actually anyone who was working on product at the time, so the POs, the BAs, um, UAT, like all of these kind of product roles were also under design. So we had that kind of capacity all working with UX and, um, and some of the other design roles. And we brought in like architects really early on, even though we didn't really need to change anything in the IT infrastructure. We brought in operations people really early on. So the first things that we did, we, we didn't say, here's what the process is going to be. We said, you know, what should the process be? and went through the sometimes kind of difficult and arduous experience of trying to get them more comfortable doing things a little differently. Because um, this was a pretty new thing for the organization. So that was, um, we didn't run this pilot and then kind of hand it off or then in invite people in. It was really kind of co-created from the beginning with the entire team um, that was necessary to own it and run with it afterwards. Um, so I, I already have a question uh, about this because mm -hmm. I think a lot of people will be um, curious about how you manage to um, get that first buy-in. Uh, because I think we, we are eager to co-create <clears throat> with people, but everybody is busy and especially when they don't see the value, even uh, in the start, it's, it's hard. So was there anything that you did in particular in the process that got you access to these people, these resources? Or was it just uh, uh, somebody at leadership level saying, this is what we need to do? It was a combination of, of leadership really supporting it and pushing it, and also us being able to tie it back to things like um, uh, analogies in the sector. You know, we were saying, here's what microfinance institutions are doing, and here's what we're missing from a commercial perspective if we're not playing in this space. Um, also, tying it back to people, which is always a powerful thing to do. And this is something that we did a lot more comprehensively a little bit later on in my um, kind of tenure with Yoma, but talking about actual people who have these needs and helping the individuals realize how different they are from these people, right? And then try to find an anchor person, like who is somebody that's like this that you know who might use this product, right? Um, but fortunately, a lot of the team was really excited to do something different. Um, and they were excited to be um, trying out things that maybe other banks in the market weren't doing. So I think there was also um, an attitudinal willingness from um, a lot of the people in the organization, which again can be attributed to the leadership giving them the space to have that to explore, and then also supporting them in exploring it. How? <clears throat> so w one element in this. Um... How important was it that, for instance, microfinance institutions were already successfully doing this? I can imagine that that gives the confidence, hey, there is something here to explore. Yeah, I think 
every every single I've worked in a lot of different countries and everybody thinks that their country is different and a lot of times countries are very different from each other like the US is the biggest pain in the butt to design for for example but the um, I think it would have been very difficult to say yeah you know this is every other country that's going on the same kind of growth trajectory as me and Mars experiencing this kind of growth in the financial sector would not have been as compelling a story as somebody's eating your cake. <laughs> Sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. As people have created a sector and if you don't step on it, they're going to occupy it and we won't have any of it exactly. um, for yeah. our organization. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good insight. I don't think a lot of uh, designers uh, do the effort to do that sort of market analysis or market research and uh, approach it from that perspective. Um, you were at the moment where you were saying, okay, we co-created it with uh, a lot of stakeholders, uh, got people involved. Um, how did that go? How, they were open to it, they, they responded, and wh what did you do after the, after the pilot? Um, well, there were some other things that, that my, um, my boss had done that were really smart, like he'd engaged a third party who'd done this before, right? So there was kind of uh, an expert brought into the mix. Um, we, yeah, it was pretty easy to prove that it was a successful thing. And the, the good thing was that the organization was pretty behind the concept even before we piloted it. So mm -hmm. we were able to then say, okay, this works. We can manage it operationally. I think actually the biggest um, hurdle that we faced, which I hadn't really thought about until now, was everybody saying, oh, we're not going to be able to manage the operations of it. or, And so we were able to prove through the pilot that, yeah, we can. So right? how did you prove it? Because proof is a big thing uh, in design and sort of uh, validating uh, impact. What did you do to prove? What, what was the proof? By, by just doing it and and saying here's what we need to do you know at this scale we need three people to be doing these types of tasks we need procedures around this we maybe need to build this new piece of technology or make this change to our core banking system and then it becomes manageable so it was actually identifying where the stress points were and what the needs were to to support it if it were real and then how those would need to scale um, and i think building a little bit of an institutional understanding of regularly revisiting of how you needed to regularly re regularly revisit to find these points in the future the the thing that's cool about Myanmar is is people think this way anyway like it's a very um, iterative culture like there's not um, there's some resistance to change um, like there is anywhere else but for the most part there's not um, there's a lot of kind of problem solving baked into how people work there and mm. and so that made it pretty easy um, you know, it, it was, there's always the, oh, we can't do it. And then somebody would come and say, but what if we did X, Y, Z? And then eventually we would get there. Hmm. Cool. Um, the, the proof part and the opera sort of uh, mapping the impact on the operations is, I think, uh, one of the big things. Again, we can also learn a lot about, like, we are pretty good at understanding customer needs and uh, proving that those needs are valid, but then sort of actually uh, helping an organization to scale it up, to embrace it, to embed it, that's, that's still a, quite a challenge. Well, it is, and it's surprising that it is because there are so many organizations that still, you know, I spend a lot of time actually going back and forth with people on Twitter with examples of this, like that still run on spreadsheets. And if you are using a spreadsheet to run a database for part of your core operation, then you need people to be involved in that process, right? So that that's operations. So there's, yeah, I think that there's this notion that like you make things digital and then they become digital and you just have to do bug fixes and stuff like that. But that's very rarely the case with any, even like a purely digital service um, that a, a user only experiences through a phone. There's still probably tons of operational procedures and edge cases that need to be accounted for. Um, and those all affect the customer experience. And so those are mm. all places where the designer needs to have an understanding. Yo, I think you had a second story also in mind, right? That you could share with us. Curious to hear about that one. <laughs> yeah, so this is, um, this is a little bit more, I, so one of the, First things that I had done to in Myanmar that kind of established me wanting to work there and people there liking to work with me 
was um, a project on money practices in rural Myanmar. So it was funded by an institution in the U.S. that does a lot of research in um, markets that are changing in terms of how they're uh, how people deal with money or um, payments ecosystems are being introduced. They try to document these different shifts and then make resources that are available to any you know financial institutions or policymakers or anyone who is playing in that market or needs to be more informed. Um, so they'd funded a project to do work in Myanmar to understand in rural Myanmar um, how the recent democratization and open elections um, was, you know, try to cap, kind of take a, a snapshot of a moment in time before things really shifted to being digital, to being more connected, to having more infrastructure. Um, and so I had gotten the chance to work on that and found the output of that really powerful um, because it was... So that there was that there were two different reports that came out. There was that one on money practices, and then a subsequent one that was funded by USAID and done with Proximity Designs. Um, these were both done with Proximity Designs. That was on the Patty and Rice ecosystem, and these are I think both examples of resources that were created in order to provide information for anyone who was operating in the market to make better decisions. And so the reason I gave it as an example is. I actually think that's a tremendously important designed process to actually get to an output where you're providing information to the world so that people can make those better decisions and ask better questions. Um, and it had to do with um, the open-mindedness of funders. It had to do with the expertise of companies like Proximity who are in market. Um, I was working with a, a company called Studio D Radio Durance and a guy named Jan Chipchase at the time, and he you know, really helped set a lot of these things up. And so I see that as a really good example of design at the early stage, like the design of these programs to create artifacts that will actually um, inspire change in multiple ways to come. Um, and the reason that I think that the, the rice, the patty to rice one was a good example was um, there's someone who I work with um, closely at Yoma, um, who is a, actually a Rabobank guy. We have a lot of shared resources and, and team members that go back and forth. And I remember him telling me that he read the Patty to Rice book to prepare himself for, going to, for coming to Myanmar, and it really helped him relate agricultural in the Netherlands, agricultural financing in the Netherlands to Myanmar. And I thought, like, this is what, what a rewarding experience as a designer, right? To have created this artifact, to have had the opportunity to make a publicly available artifact that looks at things through this uh, kind of human-centered lens talks about systems and lays out things in a way that it's actually practical to this person who's the one that's enacting change. Um, so yeah, I thought that that was a cool example because of all of the decisions and all of the things that had to come together to make that resource possible. So <clears throat> the big question uh, here is, what was it about the resource and the process to that resource that made it so effective? It's a big how question, like the, the, the tactical, the operational uh, things. What, what do you feel? Yeah, I, I think so. One is that you, we had funding for it from a, a big aid source that was willing to do something different with that money than they had done in the past. Um, or willing to, because I wouldn't say that you know, com or organizations like USAID don't typically in invest in report generation that they were willing to invest in a longitudinal qualitative for the most part, though we did do a lot of data analysis research study um, just to create kind of a, a, a snapshot of the entire ecosystem, right? Um, and we had done it because Proximity then wanted to build services and products that help solve some of those needs because they work in agricultural services development, financial services development for the rural sector. Um, so I think that that was a pretty progressive um, step for them to be willing to allocate the funds to this type of a project instead of just um, execute on drone irrigation in, in Township X. Um, and then I also think it, it's having, I think the perhaps the bigger thing is having people who then scope those projects, who have the strategic foresight to do them in a way where they're going to be beneficial long-term. And, and Proximity Designs is a great example because they are a social enterprise. So they 
get a lot of their funding for their R and D from donors, um, but then they aim to make all of their businesses self sustainable. Um, and, and so their interest isn't just in themselves. Um, they have an obligation to their donors to make things publicly available, but that just changes how the work is done. Like if we were just doing research and writing a report for proximity to only use internally, um, it would be very different, right? Um, and it wouldn't have had that, that impact that I was telling you about that, that I feel was so powerful, where it actually became a tool that anybody could use um, and, and kind of extend upon. And so I think that having a business that's able to operate with that kind of a blended business model is also um, and, and a willingness to to share resources is is also pretty unusual and important. What, what do you take as a designer from this project um, into projects that follow or will follow? Like, what's the biggest learning? Is is it about working for certain types of businesses that have a specific business model, or is it something else? Yeah, I think it actually goes back to our initial conversation, which is just asking a lot more questions about what what the goal of the work is. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and and figuring out. I personally prefer to work on things that are. Um, I I'm happy to actually work on things that just have a commercial objective, as long as that's clear in the beginning, right? If it's not shrouded in, you know, we're trying to make people's lives better. Um, by improving their efficiency in farming so that we get better yields, right? So I, I, um, I think that that clarity and um, making sure that there's, yeah, just transparency and honesty and what the work is being done is important, I, I think, really for any designer to be aware of. I think a lot of designers go into um, what would be kind of classified as impact work or social impact work, um, thinking that it's good because they're going to help people, which is a little dangerous because you need to, you know, five wise yourself. Like, why is this happening? Why am I doing it? Am I the right person to do it? Um, what is actually the outcome of this project? Could this money be spent better somewhere else? So, yeah, I think these these have given me these types of projects have given me permission to always ask those questions. Right. Um, and 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 um, uh, yeah, it's uh, is, uh, is it cr being more critical at the start or being critical throughout uh, the process, like challenging yourself? And um, I wouldn't say they are the tough questions, but uh, maybe the uncomfortable questions sometimes. Yeah, I would say it's definitely throughout. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I find really challenging is there are a lot of times where I feel like I should be removed. Like I don't necessarily think that you know, and I push myself to take on, you know, I'll write an SOP if I need to write an SOP. Or, you know, I, I will take on skills to get the, pro the work done that needs to be done. Um, but there's not always work that needs to be done that's in my skill set. And so, um, yeah, I think that that's one of the toughest things to be critical about is, is really what value am I adding? Um, or how can I facilitate somebody else adding more value or having better benefit from this? So if we try to tie these two examples back to what we started about and the choices we make, the, that, that the choices we make on an individual level impact the bigger system, what are some of the learnings we can take from this? And that I think that designers, at least speaking for myself, to, for me to feel like I'm a designer that's actually taking seriously you know, I don't want to say that making po that I'm making positive change in the world, but at least is aware of the change that I'm making. Um, yeah, I, I would say just measuring ourselves not by the output of our creative endeavors, but actually the impact that our decisions have, our involvement have on the world or on a business. Um, so I think that that's um, something that I think we, we ought to be a little bit better at. And that's where I think it comes back to, I, I measure the, the Patty to Plate book as a success because of my friend Bart saying he, he used it and it was helpful, right? Um, it's also a really beautiful artifact and we got to do a presentation about it and it's, yeah, I find it to be a really lovely body of work, um, which feels cool, but that's not how I judge whether or not it was successful. And um, 
And so I think that that is an important lens that I've tried to apply to all of my work. And I think that if more designers and more anybody who's in a decision making role thinks that way, then they'll start asking more questions and um, at least be aware of what the end state is that that their work affects, right? Because we can't always control what actually happens, um, but we can we can pay attention to it. Yeah. So that that was my question. Like, how do it? It seems so challenging often to uh, assess the impact because we're often not in the position where we directly uh, affect people, but maybe though we are, and uh, we're just not uh, attuned to seeing that, fear, feeling that, hearing that. Um, and, and it's about the responses we get uh, from people, like just one person saying that they found uh, this helpful and help them to do a better job. Like that's the, that, that's the confirmation, uh, confirmation, that's the uh, value that we're trying to bring to the world. Yeah, well, a- and why is that good? Right, not just okay. This person found it helpful, but why is that good? Because one of the things that I actually wanted to say that I was thinking about, because you asked good questions, is that I was actually thinking about the some of the best designers I've ever met, and some of them aren't designers. They're actually, or, or I, they are designers in that they practice design attributed things, but they are public servants. So they're people who work in mayor's offices, um, or people who are social workers, and. These people throughout their career have had to think about, like their number one focus is improved outcome of their work um, and improving people's livelihoods or giving people more um, agency or um, you know, providing options, making something more accessible. So that is actually, the, they're, they're so laser focused on that and, and they're trained to think about that. So I, I think that people who call themselves designers ought to be as well. I think that that's one of the the biggest things that we're going to have to overcome is that there are a lot of other people who are creative, who understand what human centricity is, who are capable of doing all the things that designers do, capable of learning how to make things, um, who have a lot of a a much sometimes better foundation for understanding the world and how to affect change. Um, And so I think that that's um, a really cool challenge. Oh, yeah. What so? What does that mean for us as a community? Yeah, that we just need to listen more, and we need to step back and um, realize that almost any space we're participating in is a space that was first owned by someone else, and um, it's our job to learn from them so that we can try to make a better outcome, but know that we might not be able to, right? Um, and and that's a tough reality as well. Like there. Um, our involvement might not yield better results than our absence in some cases. Mm. And I, if we had to summarize uh, <laughs> this this uh, this conversation, for me, one one thing that really stands out is asking more and better questions about the work you're doing, about the value that you bring, about uh, the thing that you are trying to achieve. Um, anything else that that you'd like to sort of stress? Yeah, just not getting caught up in language and, and working really hard to recognize how important communication is and communication of intent is um, rather than being dogmatic or trying to identify as something or some particular part of a process. I, I, okay. I, I, I... <laughs> If people are interested to dig uh, deeper into this, there are there any recommended resources you have? What's a good read or? Oh yeah, I so what I suggest. Yeah, I don't know actually. And this is I've always fallen flat here. This is one of the reasons that I don't write very well is because I don't. I'm not a very good um, kind of reference gatherer. Um, I, I would say not one specific resource, but if you're working in an area, read things about that area that are things that are not about design. Mm, mm, mm. Um, I, one, of the, one piece of advice I used to give people who wanted to work, a lot of my early career was spent, um, well, and also recent career because I was living in Myanmar, working in really interesting places that a lot of people don't think about very often. Um, a lot of people in the West don't think about very often. And 
um, you know, people would ask me, how do you prepare yourself? And I said, well, one, most places in the world are pretty similar because people are pretty similar. So if you can relate to people as humans, then step one. Two, also just there's so many resources. Find an English translated book um, written by a Zambian author if you're going to Zambia. Um, hmm. You know, watch some documentaries about a particular market or a particular industry. Um, talk to some subject matter experts there. So I think that, um, yeah, it's a little bit more specific to an individual, but I think that those things can be really powerful because those start opening your mind up to how much is out there. It, uh, I like that because uh, becoming a better designer often isn't about learning about design. And it's it's usually the things outside of the design that make you a really good and interesting designer. Um, Lauren, if people want to continue this conversation with you, is there a way they can reach out? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Twitter probably is the okay. best. Yeah. Um, I'm happy for people to email me as well. Um, we'll make sure that yeah, yeah. We'll make sure yeah, that they are on, in the, put them on the end. Yeah. Yeah, I'll I'll add them to the uh, to the show notes. I feel that we could continue this conversation for uh, quite a long time. Um, I really want to thank you for addressing this and sort of stressing the importance of this uh, topic about being more critical, being more humble, asking more questions. I think we sort of all know that and it should be baked in into our identity as designers, but it's good that we um, keep uh, raising our awareness to this and uh, yeah, having a laser focus like you said on this. So thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Mark. If you made it all the way till here, Leave a comment down below with the hashtag commitment because that's what it's all about. If you enjoyed this episode and find, found it helpful, grab the link and share it with just one other person today who might find it useful as well. That helps to grow the Service Design Show community and that helps me to invite more people like Lauren here on the show for you. If you want to learn more about how to design services that win the hearts of people and business, make sure you check out this next video because we're going to continue over there. So click here and I'll see you there.